congratulations to both teams for making the final. Thank you for calling me up here, Madam Speaker. Uh, first, it's been an honor to be with Jim, and the rest of the L team has been super supportive our entire time, helping us out, helping us think of arguments that were like probably too dumb to think of in the first place. All that good stuff. Really good friends on side off too. Miriam was one of the first people I lost to, so that's a <laughs> special place right here. Uh, a few years ago, when I was a novice, a few intrepid debaters ran a case titled "Our Fix." And uh, that really informed a lot of Jim and I's worldview and thinking about cases that we wanted to see. So today, we're not going to debate our things, but rather, how do we know our things? That being said, a statement. Empiricism is the belief that knowledge can only be gathered via empirically observable phenomena. So for example, something is real if and only if I can sense it with my body. Uh, case statement, empiricism, note not empiricism plus some other components, is an irrational epistemological theory. Or rational is defined as internally inconsistent. Let it soak in. speak up in a big room. Oh, okay. Just, uh, read the definition of again, just sure. Empiricism is the belief that knowledge can only be gathered via empirically observable phenomena. For example, something is real, if and only if I can sense it with my bodily senses. Uh, is that good enough for the people in the back? I'm kind of quiet. Can you use the mic? Do you want to use the mic? Yeah, I'll, I guess I'll use the mic. Does this work? Uh, yeah. Yeah. All right, you guys all good? Uh, this is a silly question. So are you finding knowledge? <laughs> yeah, Sam, Jim. Cool. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so for the default in the round, we're going to say that a true claim is a claim which corresponds to reality, that is, a mind independent reality with a capital R. For the purposes of debate, if you find it more reasonable to adopt an alternative standard of truth, we'll be happy to engage in that debate. Cool. cannot explain many fundamental aspects of reason. So we break this point down into both the theoretical aspects of the will, which are about the natural will, and the practical, which is about the will of human individuals. So under theoretical reasoning, we think that the belief that nothing exists beyond the material is founded on the premise that nothing exists except for that which can be empirically proven to exist. So to structure the burden of proof such that one must assume the non-existence of what has not yet been proven to exist is arbitrarily skeptical and paralyzes action and knowledge to a high degree. A clear instance of this is causality. Causality, as a concept which establishes necessary and universal truths, cannot be directly seen, heard, touched, or smelled. Sure, as observers, we can see one state of affairs, and then the state of affairs which immediately follows. But we only have evidence of individual instances as observers. It is illogical to say that from one sample, we can establish truths about entire principles. That is, just because we have witnessed that a ball dropping on a table makes a sound every time we've seen it, that does not imply that you see the actual cause behind that sound. It could just be that every single time you've dropped a ball, some minor earthquake that caused the sound happened at the exact same time. But furthermore, logical rules like if A then B, B then C, A then C, are logical categories that are independent of experience. Yet, we still have fundamental belief in causal principles, which is necessary to function at all. And it is irrational to not believe in causation, since it is pragmatically necessary. Even making that statement is a form of causation. Thus, it is important to accommodate unobservable principles in one's worldview. Now, the empiricist would have to say that we can infer the existence of causation from our observation, but this is logically flawed. 
This is because the empiricist can only lay claim to physical facts of the world, not abstract concepts like causality. I'll take you later. Even further, the ability to internally change whether something is true or false for oneself shows that the nature of truth can be affected by the intangibles of the will. Truth is, in a sense, partially pragmatic, and that's enough to reject that empiricism alone is sufficient as an epistemological theory. The necessary burden is not for us to prove that no part of empiricism is good. Rather, the burden is to prove that empiricism by itself is insufficient. The ability of the individual to exercise free will, we think, and resistance to environmental factors, which would otherwise shape their behavior, is contingent on their belief that such a liberty is truly possible. For example, a person can jump off a cliff, and whether he survives or not is a direct function of the kind of confidence he has when making that leap. On a more Kantian note, the ability to act freely, we think, is a constitutive aspect of the will in existence. Even if it is descriptively true that we are determined by causal forces, the phenomenology of agency is enough to demonstrate that it is logically necessary to reject that kind of determinism and suppose some kind of soul or rationality beyond the body. We have no choice but to act, and to act is to acknowledge our ability to cause ourselves independently of states of affairs. But further, we think, two people can have the exact same factual set of knowledge about the world and form different beliefs based on reflections of this knowledge. Clearly, we think, there must be something else at work. And finally, even if certain precepts are reducible to experience, the qualia of those precepts are not. So there might be physical facts about like what being a bat is, but this tells us nothing about what the experience of being a bat is like, which is inherently a non-deterministic and non-material sense that cannot be derived from empiricism. But you guys would disagree. Yeah. So how do you construct concepts like the idea of what the number one is, or the number three is, without observable phenomenon to link to that? Because outside of those observable phenomena, there's nothing to construct these things, and it's just purely human so, first of all, our side is not we're rejecting every single facet of empiricism. We're still incorporating empiricism into our philosophy. We're then just using added levels of like I have a priori knowledge to add concepts onto that. So we can firmly establish on our side of the house that these things always hold true in a mathematical sense. But it's a good thing you brought up mathematics because you can't actually prove that on your side of the house, given that there's nothing empirically true about it necessarily. <laughs> The second argument, though, is that empiricism assumes that the nature of truth is that it is necessarily material and so rejects the truth of the immaterial, but the immaterial cannot be logically proven to exist with empiricism. Thus, we think there is an internal contradiction. What we mean by this is that empiricism cannot be certain of its completeness. Either you understand that empiricism is incomplete, in which case being an empiricist is irrational because there is an epistemological theory which accounts for the immaterial, or you do not know that you do not know whether a given immaterial proposition is true, in which case it is impossible to rule out the existence of the immaterial. Those who are ignorant of their own ignorance will always be just as certain in their supposed knowledge as one who truly knew everything there was to know. So we may merely be in a state in which we refuse to believe our own ignorance. Therefore, we think, the empiricist would have no way of knowing whether their knowledge was complete, since the subjective experience of being the knower is indistinguishable from the ignorant person who believed he knew everything. Our final argument, though, is that empiricism preferences physical senses. However, we think the interpretation of our senses is subject to an evolutionary bias, which eliminates our access to truth. If empiricism is true, then it requires the endorsement of certain theories which render our knowledge meaningless. Empiricism severely constrains the scope of human understanding by discrediting that reasoning faculty upon which scientific inquiry, inquiry relies. Consider the most credible explanation for the gradual development of humanity's mental architecture, that of natural selection. Natural selection would give rise to consciousness and, by extension, the human faculty of reason, if and only if that faculty conferred some advantage which rendered its bearers better equipped to survive and propagate. Therefore, we think, our perceptions are not necessarily directly linked to the objective truth, that is, the processing of the sensory inputs through a mental filter, which arose because of natural selection, can force us to perceive things in a way that is advantageous as opposed to some way that maps onto what is the real. So let me give you a pretty interesting example Jim wrote up. Some ancient ancestor on the Serengeti sees a lion, but is unperturbed because he thinks that being eaten by a lion would be a wonderfully good time. He reasons, however, that the lion will only want to eat him if he plays hard to get. Thus, he runs away as fast as his legs will carry him, only to disappointedly find that the lion did not care for his antics and has returned to his den. Though the beliefs regarding the behavior of lions were entirely false, they ensured his survival. Hence, practical beliefs can be wholly at odds with objective reality, we think, under a variety of remedies. We think, therefore, empiricism is an irrational epistemological theory because it requires you to believe in empirical process which implies that we have no access to empirical truth at all. The idea is that empiricism creates mental processes that don't track survival. If you're going to a party and the host asks each person whether they agree with a certain political statement, 
shoots the ones who don't, then of course everyone who's at the party left will think the same thing. But there's no reason to think that those assumptions actually track the truth. They just track some measure of survival as opposed to any concept of reality. But finally, we think empiricism leaves no room to resolve disagreements about facts surrounding the world. In order to establish an empirical sensation about whether something is accurate, you need a meta theory of who is more reliable or more likely to be reliable. So, for example, I am not colorblind, but my friend Xavier is. And there's no way through our independent empirical observations that I would be able to use a meta theory to establish why my sense data is actually more accurate than his. We think empiricism does not give us the tools to resolve this theory, as these tools are by definition non empirical. For all those reasons, we're proud to propose. Thank you, Steve. Now call upon the LO to give the second constructive of the round. You're here. You're here. Before I begin, I just want to do a huge thank you to the entire SWAT team, um, particularly Nate, who's a wonderful boyfriend, and I'm really looking forward to debating him next year. Um, <laughs> Patrick, you're a great friend. I'm so sad you're graduating. And obviously, Will, it's been so fun to debate with you. Um, really great friends um, on site government. Uh, really interesting case. Um, also, to all the South, really excited to be here. Uh, you guys have been super supportive. <laughs> in the world. So therefore, if I can show you that, that all the things you're saying described as potential knowledge are actually things that we don't know at all, empiricism is the correct philosophy. So just as an overview, what we're going to advocate for is the only thing that we know is that we do experience the things around us. So this is essentially the extension of I think, therefore I am. Like I know that I experience all of you guys being here. It's possible that all of you guys are illusions and my empirical experiences are wrong. That doesn't mean that I'm not getting information from that because I'm getting the information that I am experiencing this and that's a form of knowledge, right? And it may be the only form of knowledge that we can accurately have. So, two arguments for bringing you on the off case. First, why knowledge is necessarily based on experience, and secondly, why any information you get that isn't based on experience is inherently meaningless and not actually true. So, first, why is knowledge based on experience? We say we are fundamentally physical, physical beings. We can never be certain that our reason is correct, as in, I could have someone controlling my brain that causes me to irrationally think that A and B and then B and then C were some sort of other logical train. However, I can be certain that I'm experiencing this right now because I'm literally experiencing it right now. That's the only certainty I have in life. Any attempts at rational thought could it be, uh, could be uh, sort of interfered with by an external actor. And even if my experience of the world is interfered with by an external actor, I still know for certain that I am experiencing it because that's what I'm living. Secondly, we think the only way to get knowledge, even if you can, even if you can potentially know things, is to compare with other people's experiences. Because potentially, on their side of the house, you would have a world in which you have no ability to actually know that the logical things that you're coming to a conclusion with are true. So therefore, by interacting with other people in the real world, we check our assumptions and are able to compare them and potentially find truth through that, through that sort of interaction. And I think that's like a more human understanding of what knowledge is. Third, we think that knowledge based on simply logical conclusions isn't really knowledge. It's always based on a presupposition based on experience. So for instance, if I conclude here. from the fact that I'm living here, with that, from the fact that I see you guys here, that therefore, like, it must be true that I'm a debate, in a debate round and stuff, all the logical links which I'm doing there are based on my experiences in the world. And not only that, but the conclusion I reach necessarily is being reached just by, just it, it's not really a truth. It's really just a restatement of the original supposition, which isn't really a different type of truth. It's just saying the same thing over again. Secondly, we think that you can't have information basically as a brain in a bat bat. So if you hadn't been born and you'd just been literally a brain in a dark room who had never had any experiences, we think you wouldn't actually have any knowledge of the world. This means empiricism is true because all knowledge inherently comes from your experience. 
experiences in the world. First, as Will tells you in his POI, you need context for ideas, right? So if you just had the concept of numbers, it's literally meaningless without a real world to apply it to and sort of think about. We also think you learn from being in the real world. So it's just like a biological fact about the way which our brains work that like if we didn't have any external stimulus, our brain would slowly die. We would not actually have the ability to have real thought. Also, we think experience in the real world gives us basic tools for knowledge and understanding. For example, language is something that comes uniquely from experience in the real world. You're and here. you can have coherent thoughts or actually form ideas without language. So therefore, all of knowledge is reliant on language and therefore reliant on your experiences in the real world. So overall, we think because you cannot have knowledge without your experiences in the real world, and all knowledge that doesn't come from your experiences within the real world is basically just a restatement of things you learn from the real world, we think that empiricism is inherently correct. Let's move to the on case. They say empiricism cannot explain many aspects of reason. For example, they say causality can, uh, cannot be directly seen, and we cannot know for sure whether or not causality actually exists. First of all, you wouldn't know about causality or even the concept of causality or be able to conceive of it without your experiences in the real world. So the attempt to deconstruct causality relies on experiencing things in the real world. Secondly, you can know for sure that you've experienced causality in the past. We don't think you can know from empirical knowledge that causality is inherently true, but we do think you can know that you've seen causality in the past and therefore that's what your experience has been. So we're, we're willing to operate with a really low standard of what knowledge you can actually get from empiricism, but we don't think they had offer any alternative standard in terms of what knowledge they get or why it's actually accurate. You're here. Especially because there's a potential that your brain and your logic is being manipulated by an outside force. Then they say that puricism is irrational because uh, you wouldn't have the ability to act freely and it's logically necessary that you have to have agency. First of all, we could be 100% controlled by an outside force. There's literally no way of disproving that. In fact, uh, we, we think that a lot of, that like the way which the human body is designed implies that this is actually true because our cells in our brain are literally just composing our brain and therefore causing us to have certain experiences, etc. So we actually think that determinism is probably correct. Their second argument is that empiricism assumes uh, that you have basically, an, uh, that empiricism denies the possibility of an immaterial world. Look, we don't think an immaterial world exists, right? Like the fact that empiricism denies that an immaterial world exists is not sufficient for them to say that therefore empiricism <coughs> is irrational because there's literally no evidence of an imperial world. Even if we did have evidence of an imperial world, an immaterial world, it would be from our experience. So from the like feeling that I have a soul, that's the only conception that you could have that would even make you have a thing you have a soul. You're so here. Like, conceive of a soul or have the language to describe what a soul means without actually having the empirical knowledge that gives you the basis for that. Also, we think that it's not really knowledge on their side of the house. Like the idea of the immaterial isn't knowledge, it's a theory, right? So it's not actually proven and therefore doesn't count as knowledge for the purpose of the round. Then they say we have an evolutionary bias. A bunch of responses to this. First of all, we think the fact that you have an evolutionary bias doesn't mean that your experiences are false. In that, I could have an evolutionary bias, then observe that through my evolutionary bias, I experience the world in a certain way. Whether or not that work, the way which I experience the world is not the absolute truth of the world, it's still true that I experience the world in that certain way. Secondly, the only way to check our evolutionary biases is through more empirical evidence. And this is important because like literally the only, for, take, take the example of an optical illusion, right? Like I see that when I see an optical illusion, I perceive it as moving, right? The only way to disprove the fact that the optical illusion is actually moving is using science, which looks at data and real world facts to disprove my empirical experience. So the only way to actually disprove empiricism is with more empiricism and therefore empiricism is the only way to acknowledge even if it's slightly irrational to always believe the things that you experience. Also, to advocate for imperial empiricism doesn't mean we have to advocate for it always being correct. We just have to say it's the only mode for, through which we can get certain knowledge. In fact, I think it's probably irrational for people to conclude from their experiences that everything they experience is correct because necessarily there's going to be some things you perceive that are incorrect. However, there are some things you can be certain of. For example, your own existence may be one of the only things you can be certain of and the only way you know about that is through your existence empirically in the world. Right? We think, by the way, that like empiricism isn't just like me touching the table. It's also like being a physical being, having a brain, having thoughts, etc. Then they say that this is like that this is pro that you have a processing of inputs, and it's not practical to operate based on empiricism only. We say that if you're operating without empiricism, you're literally just taking two empirical facts that you know, combining them with each other to form more ideas. We don't think that the human brain, the way it's constructed, makes sense without inputs from the real world, and therefore we think empiricism is literally the only knowledge which we can have, and we're very proud to oppose.
before I start, uh, I never give like emotional wishy-washy like speeches for them, but this is a special occasion. So thank you, Miles, for dealing with all my shit this year. It definitely wasn't easy, but I'm really glad that you're my partner. Uh, and I'm very grateful for you. Um, Miriam and Will, uh, after we hit you last year at Nats, we were completely demoralized because you just eviscerated us, but we're glad that we were having a better round this time. <laughs> so uh, we can be on par to your amazing town. So, awesome. Great. As with every speech that I give, let's start with the weighing mechanism as to how you prioritize the impacts. Because we think that all of Mirren's, uh, Mirren's arguments are good at proving one thing, not the case. That is, empiricism is a necessary aspect of our reasoning, not a sufficient one. Our condition in the case of Scott is that empiricism in alone is enough, meaning that they need to prove that all the logical leaps that they made in the case, or all the deductive reasoning that they also use, can somehow be observed in the sense empirical world when your sense data is completely unverifiable. The second observation about the burden then is that we just need to prove that this one theory is internally inconsistent. That is, it may be true that the set of all epistemological theories is internally inconsistent, but that just proves Gus' case. That is, we don't need a viable alternative. But what's even funnier about that is that if we're talking about a round in which which, uh, which epistemology is the most reasonable, our defense is literally rationalism. That is what our advocacy is, right? It's just any aspects of empirical theory plus rationalist knowledge that there are some immaterial things like the rules of logic that allow you to make the deductions that everyone is making in this round. If anything, the fact that we're making deductive reasons right now on this debate floor is evidence enough that we're not using empirical facts only. We're also using the connection between things which we can intuit to be true, not the same thing as so, let's talk about her overview. Her argument is just that, look, all they have to prove is a baseline of knowledge that empiricism gives you. One, that is not reason enough to prove that it's internally consistent, because the conclusions that she's drawing or the ways that you mash together sense data are dependent on universal laws of reason that are inviolable. That is, the fact that everyone's debate round is using things like the law of non-contradiction or the transitive property, if A then B, if B then C, therefore if A then C, are reasons as to why these logical rules exist prior, uh, a priori, or prior to any actual conception of the world that is filled with content. There is no reason to believe that these rules are sufficiently deduced from sense data. But the second reason as to what we can give you is, look, like, their burden is extraordinarily high, right? Like, her argument is that maybe we're all brains in the back. Like, <coughs> our argument is that that's not mutually exclusive. Like, we can also defend that we're uncertain about a lot of things, that maybe we're brains in the back, but it still doesn't mean that the theory is internally consistent. So here is the weighing analysis. If we can prove to you that some of her conclusions, some of Mir's, well, 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 maybe we'll make new arguments in the MO, but if her conclusions are contradictory to the premises that she assumes, then that means that ultimately uh, it is internally contradictory. So what are some premises that Miriam has? The first premise that she has is that for some reason we can corroborate sense data or add up enough sense data such that we can have a coherent scientific theory. This is when we jump a little bit on the flow and go to the third independent point. Because if Miriam concedes that the way of verifying truth on her set of house is the scientific method or some type of inductive reasoning, we can use inductive reasoning to prove that according to a correspondence theory of truth, your truth statements don't map on to a mind-independent reality. That is, evolution or other biases that come up eventually come in the way. The articulation of this argument is simple. That is, if you extend the line example, which I thought was a really great example, that sometimes <laughs> pragmatically the way you evolve means that it is beneficial for you to hold erroneous beliefs, then that means that empirically, because we know that natural selection happened under a scientific theory, we understand that our very logic is polluted from, uh, by, the, uh, by, the, uh, by pragmatist conceptions of truth. That is, we don't know what actually correlates to uh, reality with capital R, which is the truth standard that I literally answered your POCs with in the beginning of the round. So, what does that mean for her arguments? She says that, look, bias is not permanent, you can just falsify bias later by aggregating results. One, that's an adverse selection. All of us came here from the same process that's the stuff that's the same types of biases, meaning that it's not a statistically valid method to aggregate a bunch of flawed views into any conception of truth. On a less technical reasoning, she says that language is somehow the way by which that we coordinate this uh, this type of consensus. One, language is still reliant on some type, uh, some type of uh, infinite regress. That is, there's no reason as to why reason maps on only to what we think, If even if reason is necessary to look up part of the human, uh, human experience. So an example I'm going to give is that, yes, it is true that we need to grow up and we need to be inculcated in specific cultures to have specific languages. That does not mean that there are not certain universal concepts which these languages map onto and try to explain. That is, these concepts that are not inherently embedded inside the world, and yet every culture has some conception of math, or every culture has some conception of what a logical rule is, i.e. things cannot be contradictory. Those 
those are universals that can never be explained simply by sense data on their set of halves. That means on this argument alone, if they concede the authority of inductive reasoning or the authority of scientific method, they already have an internal contradiction. But let's go line by line on the LOC, starting on the first point. I'll take it now. Yeah. So if you say it's So the definition of irrational, I want to be very clear about this, is that it's internally contradictory. That is, all we had to prove was that the methodology that they used to prove their argument, i.e. deductive reasoning, is inherently not empiricist, or some conclusion they drew violated some premise that they also argued for. Those are internal contradictions in the empiricist theory. Moreover, that just responds to my overview in the next speech, because I think I did enough words analysis for this round. But the next argument is that, look, like on the gov side, we can never be certain, uh, we, we can only be certain of the experiences that we have, even if we're not certain about the underlying reality. One, this skirts the essence of the debate, because we literally define something is true if and if it maps onto a mind-independent reality. That is, it is not enough for you to say, I am certain of the fact that I am sensing things, because you need to be certain that your truth claim reflects some underlying reality, which you never know to be true. That means this argument is insufficient to, uh, to negate. But the other argument, then, is that, look, like they, uh, they say that we are, might be all brains in a bat, and that means that nothing is empirical, but at least we have basic tools that, are uh, that, that uh, like language allow us to make conclusions. One, co-ops are in our seventh house because we also defend the evolution of language. Like, I don't know what in the PMC seemed to imply that we don't believe that language is a useful tool. But second of all, even if that for some reason all knowledge is relying on language, they still need to prove why it is an impossibility for language to map on to certain material concepts. That needs to explicitly come out of the MO because it's the only way they can use uh, reasoning in the first place. So this is my favorite part. Let's extend things from the PMC. So. <laughs> Miriam's argument is that we don't have evidence of causality. In fact, we just know that we experience some kind of causality. That was literally verbatim from her speech. One, I want her to point to what is causality. Because what we see is states of affairs rapidly transitioning. That is, we see state A to state B to state C. But nowhere in there does she know or sense or hear or feel that some concept of the causality is impending upon us all. There's a difference between universal tools of reasoning, which is not a function of sense data. It is rather a function of the immaterial, which is reasoning or logic or mathematics, for instance, and actually feeling something or touching something. That is, even if we are concrete beings, it is okay for us to say that, yes, we exist in the world, but that we exist somewhat immaterially as well. Moreover, we don't need an alternative <coughs> standard. I already talked about this in the overview. But even if we were to have an alternative standard, our alternative standard is one that is way more reasonable. That is, it's a standard that allows you to have a, some type of adjudication this debate around because the essence of this discourse, trying to find some type of truth through the type of universal logic rules that we all follow, is evidence and not that there are things that are inviolable. That is, there is a constitutive aspect of your reasoning and your free will, like we pointed out in the second independent point, that definitely proves that there's some essence to being material. Her response to the free will argument is that, no, we are actually manipulated with physical things. We can believe in compatibilism. One, that's, you can't actually believe in compatibilism theoretically because we're always faced with an existential choice. That is, people who judge the God round, God round should be familiar with this argument. It's that you have no choice but to make a choice even when you're thinking about whether or not to make a choice. That is, every single moment of your life, you're faced with a phenomenological sense data perception that you have free will and therefore are undetermined by the physical world. Her argument is that we can believe in determinism. In fact, determinism is all you've got on their side of the house when you believe in a purely scientific method. This means it contradicts an elemental part of your sense data, which is that you have choice. That is. Empiricism is therefore irrational because it means that you have to believe in something that completely negates every second of your life. So the next argument that we can win on independently is the, la is the second independent point, which is that they necessarily have an incomplete theory of knowledge. The double bind was simply articulated as one, either you accept that your epistemology is incomplete, in which case you are internally inconsistent using the epistemology theory of truth that allows you to make truth conditions or truth statements about the world, which means that we win the round, or second, it is impossible to rule out the existence of the material, meaning that you still have have to have some type of agnosticism towards the immaterial, and that means you vote no. Amazing partner, an amazing friend. All of SWAT team, again, I won't, uh, 
all, thanks so much for being here and supporting us and for making me a better debater for every practice round, every night of the week. Uh, thanks to everyone uh, supporting me. Uh, my parents are also here, which is great too. Um, and uh, I have just had some of the most amazing rounds. And thanks, uh, guys, for running. It is truly a really awesome place. Why you the floor behind you? <laughs> yeah. uh, can everyone hear me? No. no. <laughs> you should use it. I don't like it. Can everyone hear me now? Okay. I want to be very clear. We think the way of this round is. But I think a lot of this round comes down to what do you think the round means. So, if you think we are in the here, but I don't think they deal with all that, we certainly can't just assume based on what they're saying in their speeches. And it's not just like obvious from conflict. So, first, we are in these points that we don't actually have to prove that like there is. <coughs> Here a few things. First, she says that we don't actually have to prove that uh, it's the only, it's an objectively correct form of philosophy, but that is 100% correct. All we have to prove that it's the most plausible form of explaining knowledge, because it is certainly not irrational to believe of this theory if it's the most plausible form of explaining knowledge. The second, they say that's not true because rationality means you know, internally inconsistent, but to be, I, we dispute this conception of what that actually means. We think it is totally plausible we believe if we think there's a risk of being correct. Second thing I want to talk about the overview, and I think this is particularly important, is the idea that it is not sufficient for them to, uh, if they cannot prove that there is a clear way to believe that logic exists and that people can, be, can rely on their own logic, there is no way for them to prove the resolution. Meaning, if they concede, and I think they do, and I'll talk about it later, that human beings necessarily evolve in a way that their logic cannot be trusted, and they cannot, cannot trust their own way to reason, they have no path to victory, because there's no way to prove what seems like a low bar, but is actually a very high bar, which is to prove a clear internal contradiction to the theory. Let's be clear about the word of analysis. It is not our job to prove that this theory is 100% correct. They must prove one clear internal contradiction 100%. They can prove any internal contradiction, but they must prove that contradiction 100%. So when they get up in the last speech and I'll give this analysis about why humans inherently can't have their logic be trusted, they lose the round, and nothing else in this round can possibly win the round for them, because even if you think that's an internal contradiction, they conceded that you might be wrong. So you can <laughs> Knowledge being 
understanding your own past experiences. Knowledges can be th having the knowledge that I at one point thought this was a chair. It doesn't matter <laughs> that it's not a chair. That can be a form of knowledge too. So she says that if you, at best for their side, you believe that Pearson and Champ construct like high concepts of like what the world actually is. But crucially, she says that observable, and it's true, observable phenomena include our own conscious states, which means that our conception of the world and our beliefs about what our conception of the world does is empirical knowledge. So when they, they, they play themselves again, because all they do is keep saying, guys, you, th that means that you can't actually uh, win the round. But what we prove is that that itself is empirical knowledge. Why is it crucial? Because we say that anything else can be twisted. They can see that evolutionarily, logic is twisted. And yes, can our, can our perceptions be twisted too, but not our own conception of our state. We can know that we Here. believe that even if it was wrong, not properly dealt with in the MG. So I uh, want to return a little more in the so, um, for, uh, first, I, I want to talk about language a little more. Like, I do think this is also a DRT for us, right? Given so far as it, even the way that they like <coughs> think of any other form of knowledge is done by language. They drop mirrors analysis that we can't think without language. I'm not sure that's true, but they probably should respond to it. Given that's the case, I think that language is the underlying basis of how things actually function, which is really problematic, and they, uh, and they, uh, it's far too late for them <coughs> to try to claim otherwise. So, it's going to be obvious. So. First about the will of humans and about how uh, we can't explain uh, causality, and that's what uh, that's what I call like. I don't think they actually like weigh this sufficiently in terms of why this means there must be this internal contradiction, but also I think what Miriam says that we can still even though we can't understand like that gravity exists, right? We can still know that in the past, like the brick fell from the, the, from the uh, building and you dropped it. This is another example of how we do have some knowledge, even if it's not all the knowledge that they want. That, that they want. Then in terms of determinism, I think this is just, uh, kind of gets a little messy. So first of all, I don't think they can just make this set. Like, I have written down the sentence they have about why determinism is a deal, and I think if you look at it closely, they don't really warrant it, right? They just say you have the sense data issue and that people don't like the conception of determinism because it robs them of like existential choice. Like, I, I urge you not to do the work for them. I don't think they properly explain this. But also, I think this isn't an argument, right? Like, just as people don't like the conception of terms of true, doesn't mean determinism is true. I don't know what this means. I also think, by the way, that we can. St there's no reason to show why that existential choice, the choice we're making our choices, is still not based on the neurons of right? So I don't know what that means. By the way, determinism is something they must win in this round because if determinism is true, that means that everything we do is constructed by based on uh, object, like objective observable phenomenon and not nothing internal, which means that is an a priori reason to vote for us because nothing else can be real except predicated on that. But also, we don't need to win the terms of right? Like, non-deterministic things, like, there can be metaphysical reasons that randomly exist. Like, it's not necessary for us to win the round. It's necessary for them to win the terms of them to actually win the round. So then I want to talk about, uh, and, like, the idea about, like, the, about feeling, right? I don't think they do well on here. So on the second point about internal, the internal contradictions that empiricism makes it, is, like, incomplete because you, can, you can't conceive of the material world. First of all, Miriam argues that the immaterial world might not exist, so that doesn't actually matter. But she also says that what really constitutes the immaterial is what we ourselves feel. So if I feel I have a soul, that itself is based on observable phenomena. They just say, that's not the case because you must be con con like logically trying to understand what that actually means. But we say that any other conception of knowledge based on the immaterial world is merely taking the initial supposition based on your empirical, your empirical observable phenomena of what you feel and then twisting that into a different standard so we don't think that actually matters. Lastly, I want to talk about, like, while well, they say that empiricism is incomplete because of the idea that, like, we conceive of situations incorrectly, and that's why problematic. But what Miriam says is a few things. First, she says this isn't actually true, right, because we don't actually know that we're incorrect about those, situ those, those situations. Secondly, and most importantly, just because empirical knowledge doesn't solve 100% of issues doesn't mean we know everything, doesn't mean it's wrong. It can still be a source of some knowledge. It means I just lack other observatory knowledge, which would have allowed us to make better decisions. At the end of the day, they have went a ton of arguments which they needed to win this round, and they did not prove a clear 100% contradiction.
Either we prove that empiricism is act actively correct, as in it's the only way that we can get knowledge, and any alternate form they offer us for getting knowledge doesn't work, but you can get real knowledge from empiricism, or we can prove it's just not actively irrational to believe in it. Like, if it's not actively contra contradictory to believe in empiricism, then it's not irrational to believe in that be just because you don't have like perfect proof that it's real. So, secondly, what knowledge do we actually have? We told you knowledge based on like sort of logic is not actual knowledge. Why? Because if I say one plus one equals two, literally all I've done is I've defined those objects such that one plus one equals two. I've literally just defined two equals two, and that I'm not actual knowledge, I'm just restating my premise. I'm literally just saying two, and then defining what that means. That's not actual knowledge. Similarly, if I say if A then B, or uh, and if B then C, then uh, A equals A equals C, I'm literally just restating A equals A. Logic doesn't lead to real or new conclusions, it just leads to restatements of what we previously had. And therefore, knowledge is, not, uh, knowledge is not actively gained through logic, so that doesn't provide a real alternative. Secondly, the only knowledge we can actively have is that we experience things. This doesn't mean our experience is aligned to what the real world actually looks like. It just means that our experiences tell us what we experience. That's new knowledge. It's something different. It's like you're experiencing something and then reaching a conclusion that is fundamentally different, and actually that means it's more real knowledge than anything logic gives you. And all of the things which we gain, uh, all of the tools which we use to even understand logic are relying on the real world. We wouldn't understand them without the real world. So it doesn't make sense. So I think we've actually proved empiricism correct. But secondly, is empiricism 100% contradictory? Because if empiricism isn't contradictory, why not believe in it? Because it provides us a basis for our understanding the world and therefore a basis for knowledge. They tell you empiricism is contradictory because our experiences sometimes contradict themselves. For example, I experienced that my friend Patrick both is a Republican but also somehow voted for Hillary Clinton. That's a contradictory However, first of all, the only way that we can even understand contradictory experiences is through empiricism, right? The fact that I'm able to check my experiences comes from the fact that I've had contradictory experiences. Uh, we think that the claim that we can only understand a priori contradictions from empiricism is a new claim. Yeah, so I talked in my uh, LO about how like you can understand the evolution, uh, sorry, you can understand an optical illusion is wrong only through like scientific understanding of like the fact that you've seen that your like experiences can be off and stuff like that. We'll take it under consideration. Yeah. Also, they dramatically overstate our advocacy. Our advocacy isn't that you can know real truths about like literally does Sean exist? I can't know that for certain. That's true. It's possible Sean doesn't exist. However, I can know that I'm experiencing Sean being here, and therefore that means that that is a real experience for me. It doesn't mean that we're like asking for a really broad conclusion. I can also recognize that my experiences could be false because I've experienced experiences being false. That's how I reach that conclusion. That's how I understand that. But overall, the basic knowledge that I'm getting in this round comes from from comes from practical experiences. Finally, we think that they talk about how like we experience free will and therefore this is a contradiction. First of all, I do experience free will, but I also know I could be wrong based on experiences and based on science. Like a lot of the reason why we challenge free will comes, for example, from the fact that we've seen that atoms in our brain tend to react with each other in a, in a different way. But a lot of the reasons why we think free will might continue to exist is because of like quantum mechanical evidence about how like things might actually not respond to the way all the time. Sorry, I don't think the argument about the unpredictability of quantum mechanics was in. <laughs> it's just an example. <laughs> We take a relatively limited definition of empiricism because it's unfair for them to say the definition of empiricism is that we always have to believe literally all of our experiences because that's just factually false in terms of how people operate in the real world because they do recognize their experiences could be wrong. So instead, we take a lower standard. Can you reach conclusions from empiricism and not be contradictory in reaching those conclusions? We think you can. You can reach the conclusion, for example, that you've experienced something. You can reach the conclusion that you've experienced free will and also experienced evidence against free will. That doesn't mean you know for certain whether or not free will exists, but you do know for certain what your experiences were. You also know for certain that you exist and they never respond to this. So our only base knowledge comes from our actual empirical experiences, and that means there's literally no alternative. Like they say they'll have to offer an alternative, but at the point where we've provided the only path to actual real knowledge, they have to lose this round because they haven't offered any other way for us to know things. It means empiricism is our only path to knowledge and therefore is correct. We're very proud of you. Thank you.
through this. All right. Everyone good? I just want to make the burdens very clear. There's the line that Miriam herself uses, which is that then we don't know anything. Perhaps we're all just brains in jars and we're just totally skeptical about everything. If that is the case, then it is irrational to believe in any epistemological theory. This was the thrust of PMC and MT. Our burden is not to show an alternative is actually much better, it's to show that it is irrational to believe in an epistemological theory, given that it doesn't actually map onto any concept of truth. Our entire argument, at like at the very best, they have to show you why you're actually leading to truth. So what I'm going to do for you in this speech is take you through two things. First, I'm going to show you either how we win the round because empiricism makes wrong claims about what the truth actually is, which is the standard we set out in POCs, or I can show you that there are preferable epistemological theories, even given that skepticism, that because the end goal of an epistemological theory is to provide the most complete set of knowledge about the world, a drop argument from the MG violates all of the conclusions that they have reached on their side of the house, making it inconsistent. So. Why is it unlikely that empiricism maps onto the world? We say that there is an evolutionary bias that skews towards certain ideas. The way that our brains are composed are usually meant to track survival as opposed to any sort of capital T truth that corresponds with the reality of the world. These guys have what I thought was a super cool argument when I first heard it, which is basically that the only way that we can actually adjudicate between things is to take empirical examples and try to question them. Remember the dropped argument from PMC, which is that there is no actual way to adjudicate between empirical examples unless you have a meta-theory about what is correct. This is to say something like rationality or the scientific theory, which are immaterial substances, these are concepts that people have, are necessarily the ways in which you adjudicate. So, they have another piece of offense here, which I think is very interesting. They say that because things stem from the fact that they are empirical, they must necessarily be empirical. We tell you that there are certain things that are actually emergent properties of nature that don't necessarily have to be totally empirical themselves, that don't have to map onto anything in the empirical realm, which means that a lot of their arguments about how the scientific theory and language can only be derived from the empirical world makes them empirical is actually wrong. Remember the burden for what empiricism is. Can you taste or touch the scientific method? No, but you use this a priori concept, apply it to examples in the world, and then use it to evaluate those truth claims. The other way we can win this round, though, is talking about the feelings that they have. So they say that there are these certain feelings we possess, like I exist, that's the only thing that we can lay claim to. Again, if we can show you that this, first of all, doesn't necessarily have to be empirical, as in, remember the drop argument from PMC that the qualia of experience is actually something that isn't inherently non-empirical, the fact that you experience existence is not an empirical fact about the world, means that all of the arguments they gave us about why just existing is enough to be empirical is actually wrong. At this point, those are two burdens they had to meet, and those are two independent ways that you can vote to explain why this doesn't matter to truth. Second question, though, are there things that are actively better? So, Miriam and Will did a lot of good stuff in responding to the line by line, but they really missed the overarching picture. Remember what I told you at the top of this speech. If we can show you that there are certain things that exist outside of an empirical theory, then we win the round because it's not enough to have this null set argument about what epistemology can lay claim to. The thing we hear from MO is like, maybe we can only be certain about a limited substratum of things, and therefore we should just think that uh, empiricism is the only way to be certain of those. <coughs> Our argument was, if you know that there are other theories out, so first of all, that's not a very good epistemological theory. For example, you can't be super certain about the way that your judging paradigm works, but you still have to operate the world in some way. You still have to make actions and lay some claim to knowledge. But furthermore, we told you that there are other ways to actually adjudicate on this question. So, we say that there is the experience of free will that exists extremely strongly in each individual. Point of order. So it wasn't fly to that argument. I think the impact was just that there are certain pieces of sense data that are necessarily implying the existence of material, which I think this argument allows us about to get to. I mean, if that's the argument he's about to get you to, that's fine. But the argument he just made is what I'm calling you. Yeah. <laughs> so, so there's also our uh, second point, which is that there are things that exist beyond that. But I'm sure it's safe for We do hear a new response in the MF, correct me if I'm wrong, that their quantum mechanics are somehow responsible for the feeling that we have free will. So first of all, that is just an inherently deterministic standard, i.e. it could just be random, but that doesn't actually necessitate free will. But there are things that we don't understand about this, and I'm not exactly a science major, so I can't like, claim you a lot of these arguments, but I don't think that this is a sufficient enough experience. 
The argument basically is this. We definitely have the experience that we have some sort of free will insofar as you can only opt into free will no matter what. Even if you believe in determinism, to do that is a choice on our side of the house, and that implies the existence of some immaterial thing. Therefore, the Wang analysis is we have to show you one thing that couldn't be explained by empiricism, just one that lays outside of that claim in order to show that you could add other epistemological theories onto it in order to better explain it and is therefore rational. We think that that one thing is an example of that. But finally, I would talk about a little the idea that all things stem from this epistemology. So, the question I think in this round, at the end of the day, the only way you can still pick up thought is, is everything inherently an empirical property? Which is to say, is language empirical? Is all knowledge empirical? So, it's not enough to prove that the foundation of a lot of this knowledge is empirical. You have to show that the end results and the conclusions themselves are empirical. You have to show that the frameworks you gain along the way are also empirical. This is to say that even if we use some sort of sense data in the first place to arrive at those conclusions, we then get different types of immaterial conclusions at the end of the day, which are a lot better and clearly explain different things outside of our epistemology. But even still, Jim tells you, and this is the dropped argument, that there are a priori concepts we come into the world with, things like causality and space, which makes it very difficult to understand why sense data have to fill those in, since it's always filtered to our a priori cognition of what the world looks like. For all these reasons, proud to propose.